You're listening to the Trake Baby Podcast. It's a podcast for Trake parents and members of the Trake community. This is episode 16 for May 16th, 2021, an interview with Svenja. Thanks for joining us today. Before I introduce our next guest, I want to let you know that you can find the Trake Baby Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. And be sure to like our Trake Baby page as well as join our Trake Baby group. Both are on Facebook. Follow at Trek Baby on Twitter and visit our website, trekbaby.com, for a list of information resources as well as to sign up for email subscriptions so you never miss an update. Today, we're speaking with a real-life superhero. She's an ENT nurse clinician located in Central Texas by the name of Svenja Atchley. Her full professional title has so many abbreviations that trying to say them would not do them justice. But personally... I think she's the expert of experts when it comes to trait care. I'll put her full title in the show notes. And when parents are told their child will require a trait, Svenja, at least at our hospital, is the first person they meet as she prepares them for trait care. In fact, she taught my wife and I what to expect with our son, John, and how to care for him. Here's her interview. Uh, I'm a registered nurse. And my official title is uh, ENT nurse clinician. So I've been doing this start May 8th was exactly 15 years. So I go back. I was an ENT nurse in Germany and then I came here and I did med search nursing for, for like 12 years. And then this position came open and I, I took it and I've done this ever since. And initially, you know, my background was not pediatric. So, but I've always wanted to be a PD nurse because my mom was one. So, uh, <laughs> then, um, I was like, oh, my God, you tell me I have to go to a NICU and pick you. But the nurse trained me. They had the job before me, trained me for like six weeks. And uh, then immediately I had three babies in NICU. And I said, I just have to learn this. And I dove in with evidence-based research and studied all summer long and made a bunch of changes. And uh, probably enjoy working with the PD patients and their parents probably the most. It's, it's very rewarding. It's, it's a lot of fun. So like your son, you remember when we gave him the, the, the cap and he made sounds and that's like almost the last step before getting rid of the trach and then getting rid of the trach. It's, it's just really exciting. Well, it's uh, emotional. Of my job. It's mm-hmm. emotional as a parent too. And, you know, um, you know, his, the first time we really wanted to, wanted to cry, I guess, was when he got mm-hmm. his speaking valve um, back in, uh, we were in another part of the state, but um, we were still going to uh, the, the hospital. Um, mm-hmm. and so what we did was, um, but, but when you see that, you, you want to, you just, when you finally hear your, your child cry, uh, cry and make noises, uh, it's just, it's emotional. And I'm sure as a, I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm sure it's, it's probably very, very similar. Uh, speaking oh, of child crying, so... I've got a child in somewhere in the other part of the house so <laughs> that may be bleeding through the microphone, oh. but who's, who's screaming and crying right now. But, uh, uh, so what is healthcare like in, uh, in Germany, how how was there a was there a, a, a did you have to acclimate yourself to to differences or how, you know was yeah there... yeah I took a test for graduate before nursing school and um, passed it. I, as a matter of fact, I went to the military library and got a really big nursing manual from 1972 and <laughs> read through that. That was in the 80s so or early 90s. Read through it, try to figure out all the words I didn't know the nursing terminology. And when I passed the test for graduate of nursing schools, then I um, took a, I was able to take the NCLEX test. That's an exam that all the nurses that have graduated from nursing school take. I mm-hmm. passed it, and then I started working here. So, so was, this, my, was this in was Germany or something. was this in the U.S.? Was this in Germany in the US. or U.S.? Yeah, I took the first test in Germany because I knew my husband was going to come back to the States. So uh, I knew we were going to come and I would have to want to work here. So I had to do all this. I had to do a bunch of preparations pass this big exam and then uh when we moved here then i took the NCLEX, studied for an entire month my kids were so little they were just playing in our backyard while i was sitting there next to them studying and then i passed the NCLEX, and then i started working here and i was trained um i was precepted probably for six weeks and then so you were but you were an own. rn were you an rn before you came over or did you because you're yeah you, uh-huh. okay so you were I an rn originally we didn't have we, we don't have our in Germany. We just have a nurse, and that's what I was. I just was a nurse. And then um, when I came here, I got the option between LVN or RN exam because we didn't have the distinction in Germany. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to try RN. 
fail, I can still do it. LVN, and I passed the RN, so that was pretty cool. So it was just a matter so, of testing. It was a different kind of test you took when you came to the States, and that mm-hmm. is what certified yep. you to be. Oh, okay. Yep, and well, then I took the NCLEX. It's a test every nurse has to take in the States when they graduate from nursing school. So I had to take that, and when I passed it, then I got the official title as registered nurse. The only difference was that I never went to American nursing school. I went to a nursing school in Germany. I see. So I had to kind of, I had to kind of brush up on nursing in America. You know, learn some of the terms, learn some of the differences, and uh, I was kind of fortunate to, to pass the test and start working here. Right. So I guess um, a question would be, what, what, how did you have an option for for a respiratory care? Well, the thing is, I when I I always liked the job of a nurse clinician which I am a nurse clinician right now, which means I'm not bound to a specific nursing unit, but kind of work all over and be somebody that trains patients and their families, that trains staff, that has an advisory role. I always enjoyed that. And the nurse that had the job before me, because I used to work ENT in Germany, ear, nose, throat, and I was familiar with trach tubes on adults, you know, Mm -hmm. because we, we had quite a bit on my unit. And so the nurse that, that had the job before me, whenever we had to take patients, she sometimes asked me to help help her out. Or if we had a patient on our unit, I did, did uh, you know, the trick tube changes. And then when she got ready to retire, she asked me if I wanted her job. And I was a little scared about the pediatric aspect of it because mm-hmm. that was not my background. And this is, at this point, you're in the States. Me. At this point, you're in oh, the yeah, States. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. I've already been here for 12 years. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was already here for 12 years and then I got my bachelor's degree and I was ready to move on to something different from mid-surge nursing. And that's when I, uh, so after 12 years, I, you know, moved over to the ENT nurse clinician role. And I've been doing this now for 15 years. Oh, my goodness. So I guess a question would be, you know, I I guess you encounter a lot of parents who are probably, this is going to be new for them. I mean, it was new for us. And so, oh, yeah. you know, I, I believe I recall you had very good, you know, like I guess I say bedside manner or understanding of the situation that you know we're, we were mm-hmm. new to it. How do you, um, you know, I guess what's going through your mind whenever you're told, "Hey, you need to go show a, some parents how to take care of a, a trach child that they're new new at it." You know, what's generally going through your mind? Oh, uh, so it's I, I work in the children's hospital, you know, in two settings really. I work in the neonatal ICU and in the pediatric ICU. And when I hear trach, really from the, the first thing, when, when, when people are like the ENT doctors or the NICU team or PICU team approaches me, let's say they're very different worlds. Let's talk NICU first. Mm-hmm. So if they approach me in NICU, um, I, my first thing is this. I ask, uh, why do they need a trach? Is it a preemie that can come off the vent because their lungs were damaged from being premature? So that was my first day. Is, is it this kind of patient population? Somebody were there's pretty good chance that with time they cannot grow their problems and uh, they can they can then, you know, get their trach out. Or is it a child that's neurologically devastated that had uh, a very, very complicated birth or was born with uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of health problems where sometimes on some of these children, so the NICU team might even consider that should we just transition to comfort measures or should we do a trick procedure? The, so I, I I always kind of want to know what the main reason is why the child needs a trach tube. Uh, then uh, the next thing is, is this a child that's... Um, so in pediatric ICU, often my, my first question is, is this a child that's in foster care or is this a child that lives with a family? Because a lot of kids that are in pediatric ICU need a trach. Some of them already live in medical foster care because the parents... Either it was a non-accidental trauma and uh, they were taken away from the families because of that and have severe brain injury and are mm-hmm. placed in foster care. And then they have a lot of swallowing issues and secretion management issues. And that's why eventually they'll need a trach. So if they're in foster care, usually those foster families are very familiar with trach patients and children. And it's just a matter of meeting them, introducing myself if I've never met them before. And they don't require usually a lot of training because they already know. Right. Uh, and they're not scared. They often are the ones that actually recommend, especially if they take a new child in that came out of area 
and the first thing they say, oh my God, the shot needs it, right? They can hardly, they're, they're so miserable and can hardly, hardly breathe right. And they're often the ones that initiated it. So I don't have to talk to the family about uh, their, you know, they're not afraid of a trach. They see the benefits a trach can have for a child. They can see how it makes life easier for a child. If it is a native family that, for instance, had something happening to their child, uh, in, in pediatric ICU, it could have been either a general disease process that where, where it gets slowly worse, where eventually the children get to the point where the shot gets to a point where it needs a trach tube, or um, it is a child that has had something devastating happening, um, choking on something or near drowning, things like that. So the, those families that are often very, very um, stressed because of the the terrible situation that, you know, the hospitalization, the not knowing if they're shot going to survive these things. And, and then they, it looks like they're surviving. And then we're thinking they, they, will, they will need a trach. And then we throw this at them. And it's often very scary for these families. It's scary for the families that are not familiar with a trach. So I, I always want to know from the team a little bit about the family situation. And this is all going I on behind the them. scenes. Like this is before yeah, this is when you, you've first, met the family. Yes. Yeah. When they first tell me, Svenja, uh, we have a child in room, let's say, 310 that needs a trach. Can you meet family? And then I'm like, okay, is it a foster family <laughs> or is it a native family? And, they're, and then they're like, in PQ, for instance. And then they say, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a family, this child. Oh, they're really involved. They're really sweet. This kid had this and this happening and they'll need a trach. Or well, this kid has had multiple hospitalizations and we just can't keep it healthy. They don't manage their secretions well. They have pneumonia after pneumonia, or they they fail their sleep study. They need a ventilator at night, and they can't use a feet pad by face. So those kind of things. So so I get a little bit of an idea from the from the team, and then I meet the family. And I like to meet the family usually as soon as possible. At the moment somebody mentions trach, I would like to meet the family. Doesn't always happen that way, but. Uh, mainly because I've, I've worked with children in the hospital, but also afterwards. And I can give the families, I think, a pretty good picture of what to expect. You know, and, and John was, it was several years ago. I, I still learn. Every day there's something new I learn, and I try to incorporate that. So, so just meeting the families and trying to give them a pretty realistic idea what it would be like uh, for, their, for them and for their child um, when they have a trach. Right. Well, you know, I, in our case, you know, we had, we had come off of him having a, a G button. So we were somewhat familiar. And I, by the way, I don't, we, don't, we can, since you're familiar with this case, I don't have a problem with us talking about mm-hmm. it publicly, but, um, or else I wouldn't have you here. But, uh, I, you know, in our case, we, uh, we, um, had him on a G button. So we were somewhat familiar with equipment wise. So we weren't that, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? So, uh, shock. Now I'll say that trait care is a lot different than G button care. You know, it, mm-hmm. it is a lot different. And um, for us, it was the, the confusion, that I say confusion, the frustration was, you know, originally, okay, we, he may, he may need some work done on his, 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 his throat, you know, okay. So they, that was, mm-hmm. the but we don't think he'll need a trach. Okay. Okay. That's great. Well, we need to do a sleep study. We don't think he, the worst case, he'll need a trach, but we don't think that's the case. And then it, for us, it was step after step. And then it was like, well, no, he'll need a trach. And so for us, that was the, you know, I look back though, and I wish we had kind of followed along sooner and closer and have said, yeah, absolutely, let's do it. You know, historically so looking back. I picked up something from you right now that makes uh, a lot of sense. You know, like uh, to me, that makes that, that just kind of was very eye opening in a way when you, you know, you said, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. So in the worst case scenario, he will need a trach. But we don't think it's going to be that bad. You know, he won't need a trach. So to, the way it, the trach was brought up was already as the worst that possibly could happen to your child. And then for some crazy reason, you know, this could be for any child that go that has a complicated hospitalization, or we try to extubate, we try to get him off the vent. If that happens, so the worst case would be he would need a trach and go home with a ventilator. You know, but it's already sounding like the worst possible thing that could happen to your child. And then when it happens, and then I come walking in there, oh, let me talk to you about a trach. You know, 
families often already so scared and so so afraid and they, they, they feel they're responsible over their child because their child can't make their own decisions and they don't want to make a wrong decision. And so they're, they're very, they're very conflicted and very stressed and very afraid. Right. You know, and, and to me, I've had, fa- I've had a mother say, you know, we went into a family care conference. We were ready to fight for our child. We did not want to trade. We were ready. We did our research. We were fighting to convince the team our child did not need a trade. And, when I met them, I had not met them uh, much. I, tend, I think I met them during in the care conference. I didn't have the opportunity to meet them before. It was a NICU baby. And uh, the first thing, he had a lot of problems breathing due to some, some issues, you know, with how the nose was formed and the upper airway was formed. And uh, he was struggling to breathe. I just peeked at him and I could see he was struggling to breathe. And when I told the parents, I said, well, um, when he gets a trach, it's going to change your life. It's going to make your life much, much harder, you know, when when he gets a trach. However, for your child, a trach will make his life much, much easier because he can breathe comfortably. He's not fighting for his breath anymore. And the moms told me later, because kind of after that, they just were, it just was a switch within the family. And they were just listening to what we had to say. And they're like, okay, we're signed a consent. When can we do this? And I was not aware that they were trying to fight not to get the trach. And later the mom told me, she said, you know, when you said it's going to make it easier for our child, we, we that's all we want. We don't want him to struggle. He's been through enough already. We want, we want things easy for him. If it's hard for us, it doesn't matter, but we want it easy for him. Um, that, to me, it's just such a common thing. Oh yeah, obviously. But but for them, it was it was a, just an eye opener, and they and and I've noticed that with a lot of families, when uh, if we would say, you know, in the worst case scenario, he would get a trach. If we would just say, we'll do what we can, and if he needs a trach, you know, that that we don't we don't tell the parents per se. This is the worst possible thing that could happen to your child, mm-hmm. because it's it's kind of probably the worst that could happen to the parents. Because of from from you're gonna have nurses in the house, you're gonna need supplies. You know, you need to always watch your child. But for the child, it's <laughs> well, maybe I, I not almost tripped over the worst. You know, I almost tripped over. We still have some residual supplies that still still arrive. Oh, I almost bad. tripped over them walking in this after, this evening. You know, so <laughs> I uh, I'm reminded. Oh well, yep, there's still some supplies coming in. Now we've also had a lot less come through since we no longer mm-hmm. since he was decannulated. He no longer. A lot yeah. of stuff we don't need. So but. would you would you think that's also like that? You know, would would I mean? And every situation is so uniquely different, and you can't say that that um, you know every, the dynamics between the parents, or if it's a single mom, the single mom and friends, or single mom and her parents. Uh, you know, the, the dynamics are so different for for every child. So it's, you can't relate one to another. You know, but I'm thinking a lot of parents have felt that. They definitely don't want their child to suffer. They want to make things easy for their child. And if a trach is the means to do that, to make it easier, to give them better sleep so they can be more active during the day, so they don't struggle for their breath, all these kind of things. You know, there's many reasons why children need a trach, but ultimately it's to make things easier for them. So they, they're they more comfortable that most parents then don't feel so um, objected to it anymore. How, would you say that? Yeah, True no, a hundred percent. I I think that um, for us, it was it was you know I, I'd say first few days, few weeks are still you're in, in still in shock or at least still acclimating. You know, maybe that's the word mm-hmm. for it. And then um, you know after you get into a routine, you start to realize, oh, we can still go places. We can still, and I know every situation's a little unique. So there's some situations where you know kids are going to be on a vent all the time. And in our, in our case, John didn't require that except for when he was sleeping. So I know there are definitely situations where it's a lot, I guess, more challenging. Um, but in our case, we could still go out on, on trips. We could go on vacations. We just had to lug along the, the, the suction vacuum suctioner. And then we would take his, you know, at the time his, his vent when we were needing it. And so there was a lot more you had to plan for, but you, you, you basically acclimated to it. It just became your normal, normal life. Yeah. And so yeah. it, it is something you can acclimate uh, as a parent. You can get used to 
Um, you'll find you'll yeah. find that routine, and then you'll realize this was a good decision because, you know, he's doing better. He's not yeah. his stomach. His chest isn't. In our case, John, when he was breathing, his chest would cave in as it was as he was breathing, which isn't isn't natural at all, and mm-hmm. it's because he was struggling. And so for us, it became a. Um, it was like, hey, this was a good decision. You know, it's challenging yeah. at times, but at the end. You know, and we didn't know if he was going to be decannulated or not. You know, we, you know, and and then for a while for us it became, you know, he has the trach. Okay, well now he may need a vent. We're like, oh great, you know, it's it's continuing, yeah. you know, but you know that was probably the the peak for us was when he had the vent, and then over time he just got to where he he did. then he needed oxygen on top of that, mm-hmm. and then it then but over time as he aged in our case. You know, he we said, okay, we don't need the oxygen as much at night. We don't need the vent at night. So that was removed from our list. Um, mm-hmm. Just just seeing the progress. And so looking back, I think also it made us better parents from a humbled, from a humbled standpoint. You know, it yeah. let us value things that that we, most, a lot of parents would take for granted. You know, we, we were, even we took for granted. It, it humbles you. It says, hey, you know what, yeah. there are others out there who are, uh, in a maybe it could be a worse situation. There are others who are scared, which, which again, what motivated me to do start to start the podcast was was mm-hmm. so that we could at least hey hear other stories of people going through the same situations. You know, I, yeah, that's what I think. It's very helpful. The thing is with with my patients, so I have like the two different types. You know, I have the ones like John that we do the trach, and they have and and they slowly outgrow their problems. What some kids have reconstructive surgeries, they have their airways open back up, or they have their, if they need craniofacial surgeries, uh, and they have to wait a little bit until they can have their cleft palate repaired or their craniofacial issues taken care of. Usually they have to be a little older for that. And then step by step, they will get less and less, they get more stable, and then eventually work towards getting the trach out. So we have those kind of patients, and then I have the patients that gradually get a little sicker and a little bit more dependent and a little bit more dependent until they might eventually pass away. So I have those as well, but the majority of my pediatric patients are the ones that actually wind up doing better or at least staying stable and managing their life and still having fun and doing stuff and being kids. They don't let this stop them from living their life. A trike, you know, it's, Sure. Well, it's, I talked to a, a, a mother, yeah. mother a few weeks ago who whose child um, is in her thirties now, but she's she's, um, you know, it's not quite. Um, oh, I forgot what the name of it is, but uh, she, she, the daughter's not going to get any better, you know, and and, mm-hmm. and she can't communicate, and and makes no, you know, it's just it's just going to be, you know, that's the that's how it's going to be, but even she said that she's found ways to to still as they were growing up she had a son and they were able to to still have a life you know and, and mm-hmm. she does not regret it was very it was very motivational to me to hear another parent say who who's who had a situation what were different than ours um where it won't be get, they won't be getting any better but still be positive and say but you know what you still find the positive you still you're still you still and you do it for them. You stay positive for them and for yourself. And and so, yeah. I, I guess in your line of work, you though you you see all different different um, perspectives of it. Yeah. Um, and and I'm sure, as you said earlier, each one's unique. Um, what would be? And you kind of touched on it. What would be some? What are some things you see new new trait parents do that you would like? You're like, okay, don't do that. You shouldn't do that. Don't worry. Um, from anything from even cleaning, showing us how well, to clean. Of, the, the, well, well, one of the things that, that uh, you know, some parents uh, get informa- get wrong information, like some crazy stuff on YouTube or whatever, you know. So that's something. Uh, some and, and one of the things, too, I, what I can, the advice I can give to parents is take whatever you can from your healthcare team. Learn, learn, learn. Be there while your child is in the hospital. And learn as much as you can. Be your child. You will be your child's best advocate. And and some parents always think, well, I'm going to have nurses, and they're going to. And I'm like, no, 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 those might be brand new home health nurses. You might need to teach them. You know. So, but right. my biggest advice is for parents: learn as much as you can. Another advice I have for parents, I would say, and I don't know how realistic this is, but it's also to take a little bit of time for yourself. 
um, especially, you know, when you're married, take a little bit of time for yourself. Once you know you can trust the nurses, um, do something, have some alone time or have some time with siblings, you know, just uh, to recharge a little bit, especially if, if it's stressful and there's, there's a lot of shifts, you don't have nursing, um, you know, just, you know, to, to help out with that. But mainly those are some things um, to, 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 to learn as much as you can and, um, and also to support each other especially when one family member, maybe uh, it's a husband and wife, a mom and a dad, and one of them is very scared and the other one is not. I've had sometimes when we did trick training where one was really, really good and I showed them once and they got it down and the other one was a slow learner, was not very medically inclined, and then the other one rolled the eyes at him and (laughs) then there was stress and strife and, and, you know, conflict going on there. Yeah, well, and I'm like, support each other, you know. Right. I've had one mom, she looked at me and said, Svenja, I'm a hairstylist. I don't do this stuff. My husband learns, is going to learn all of this. And no, 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 you have to learn too. But he really stepped up at first and then eventually she came to Trey Wins Clinic, follow up, and she just said, Svenja, remember when I told you? And said, yeah, I, I know everything now. Well, <laughs> I've learned, you know, but support each other and, and don't be just mental, you know, if one has a harder time, just kind of be there and try to find all the resources you Use all the resources you have in your community, in, in church, extended family, neighbors, whoever you know. Try to try to utilize uh, as much help as you can, and, and 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 basically, as parents, support each other. That's that's one of the big big advices I think I have. Those are usually the children that do the best. That have parents if they were married before the streak happened, they stay together, they support each other, and they support the child and the other children. And and that that is usually um, those are usually good, good outcomes. Well, a- another thing, yeah, that's the one of the things. Another thing I that I see where I sometimes like I've had children in NICU, they're preemies, they're on a ventilator, they can't come off the ventilator. They're almost at forty gestational weeks now. They they not going anywhere, you know. And the parents don't want to try it because that's like the worst thing that possibly could happen. Let's do another steroid challenge. They give them steroids and hoping that it'll help the lungs a little bit let's try this again let's try that again and things just not moving forward and then the child pulls the intubation tube out needs to be reintubated pulls it out needs to reintubate it and and those kids have had an intubation tube in place sometimes for months and uh, then keeping it in there longer and longer and longer can completely scar up the airway and I've had some kids and, and it delays the discharge from the hospital and then they maybe catch infections while they're in the queue so um, when when the NICU team says we think the child needs a trach, if they have complete objections, get a second opinion at Texas Children's or Cooks, and usually they will trach the child and send them back to us. But um, ultimately, when the team thinks it's time, try not to delay it by another couple of weeks and months because those are hard for your child. Yeah, even I when agree. a child and and if a child, some kids don't have, they have nasal CPAP going on. And the parents say, well, we don't want trach. They're not intubated. Hopefully they get better. And the problem with the nasal CPAP mask is it sits on the nose. And the children's brain development gets, gets hampered because their vision is distorted because they see that mask. And it actually affects them developmentally, which is they can't even move well. But it, even that mask on their face constantly affects them. I had no idea that... NICU team told me that once. It says, yeah, yeah, this is just really bad. This is such a neurologically intact child and this mask on their face, you know, we can't keep this in indefinitely. So those are all things. So when the team thinks it's time, uh, we've tried everything, the, the, the safest, best way would be to do a trach that the family then um, tries to go with it or get a second opinion, but not just to kind of don't, delay it. Don't delay, delay it. Delay well, it. And that's what's interesting is is uh, in medical field, you know, you've got individuals who who have got the experience and have got the degrees and have the and again most of it's experience, and you know, mm-hmm. you you don't just lightly say, oh, let's get them a trach. You know, it's it's something you no, guys have probably like, weighed very it's heavily. Truly, oh yes, 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 heavy. Yeah, absolutely. 
And and so no, I can. I was earlier. I was just going to say that you know, in our case, it was hard for me to be able to to do the tasks like a track change. Not so much that I didn't want to. It was just that my wife would. She and I get. I bet this is common. Is the, the one of the one of the members of the family will kind of take it upon their own personal responsibility to where I'm going to do it. Nope, I don't want you to do it. I'm going to do it. And and that's just because of of you know um, maybe out of concern or to them it's like in her case she told me she's like I'm just I'm I'm doing everything I can and I I feel like it's a contr- it's it's to help me stay in control of the situation so I would try to change yeah. it now we we obviously worked through that but it would it was like no 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 I got it no no you don't need to do it I got it I got it mm-hmm. and it took time to convince her to say hey listen I'm I'm not, I haven't got to do it as much so I'm a little rusty but I need you to walk me through it and I can, and we'll be okay. And sure enough, we were fine. Um, yeah. I even had dads where the child was hospitalized and it needed to have a routine trait tube change. And that trait has been there for a while. And a dad happened to be there and said, you know what they do for a tube change. Do you think we both can do this together? Because my wife does not want me to do this. She <laughs> always does the tube changes, but I really, really feel like because there's times I'm alone with my child yeah. and what if something happens, you know, and I'm like, absolutely, let's do a trick tip change. Yeah. And, and what, uh, one thing that I'm doing now that I did not do when I trained you guys, PetSmart donated a whole bunch of stuffed animals to Children's Hospital. And they, they look like, they have like arms and legs, so they're cats and bunnies. Mm-hmm. But I picked the ones that look like a little human in a way. And I shaved their neck a little bit, shaved the fur, I'll put a trach in, and then each family gets one of those, either a cat or sometimes a mm-hmm. bunny. If I have a little girl, I give them a little bunny. And they're about the size of a newborn. And we can animate them, and the tube changes feel very realistic. And we do much simulated now, which we didn't do that much with your son. We, so we do a lot of training simulated. Oh, and so awesome. sometimes we're like, okay, let's do a little simulated training, you know, and then uh, change the uh, change the trick. But I think that makes a big difference. I was like, why did I not do this any sooner? So I've done it for a couple of years now, but I know I didn't do it for you guys. I think. I just threw you in the fire. Let's just do it. <laughs> you know, that is funny. Like yeah, no, things. it was, it was, you know, we, I, I think we had, I think, I mean, we, we left feeling uh, with, we had enough knowledge. No, we were still obviously nervous. You know, I mean, we were mm-hmm. actually, even up until before he was decannulated back in March, we were, there was always a feeling of being nervous. You know, he was older at that point and sometimes he would do his own or he would, you know, he, but you always felt like, okay, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. Of course he would tell mm-hmm. you now, you know, and, and, uh, and so it, 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 the perspective definitely changes. And also and we were fortunate that my mother-in-law was a, was a registered nurse. And so she, while she hadn't had a lot of trait patients, uh, when she was a nurse, she at least was familiar enough with the procedures to do what needed to happen. And so she would, she would, okay, so I'm going to admit to something that I'm sure you don't want to hear, you know, the cleaning kits that she would, she adhered mm-hmm. to it to hundred percent exactly following the right pro- proper procedures and cleaning. And, but I noticed with parents, sometimes we're just like, <laughs> just mm-hmm. rinse it off, put it back in. <laughs> mm-hmm. Especially if they're, they're pulling out all the time. And there's also a difference if you have a child that's on a ventilator uh, and very fragile medically, or somebody that's completely fine, just has some airway stenosis or, or is waiting for more, surgery, but they're otherwise uh, very robust, healthy children that don't really have a whole lot of other medical needs besides uh, an airway problem or Mm -hmm. something, you know. Uh, So those those kind of kids are definitely a different category than than a child that's very medically fragile, especially a little um, NICU baby (laughs) with with, uh, on a ventilator. Those I'm uh, very picky about, you know, how what we do and how that we keep everything as clean as we can. Now, here's a child that's touching all different kinds of things, and then it's touching the trait, and then it's touching this and that. You know, oh, <laughs> you right. just do the best you can. You well, and I'm not advocating, you, can, you, know? you know, parents who are listening and you're taught to, to clean the trait, follow the proper <laughs> procedure, you know, you should. Um, and I, but, yeah. you know, and I will admit, though, there are times that we were like, ah, oh, just, just blow on it and put it back in. <laughs> yeah. If there was a problem. Uh, but no, I'll give our, 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 her mom was very, uh, very adamant about, she followed the, the procedures. Uh, I'll admit that when I had to take notes on several times to, to properly yeah, and, clean and the tray. And I'm saying that you have a cleaning kit. That's what I, I've had a foster mom and she just did it, showed me how to do tray tube change and she just threw it. I always avoid the diaper area in a, in a bed. 
I don't yeah. want the trach tube laying in the diaper zone. I, if I take it out, it might be landing at the head of the bed because we don't put a diaper next to a child's head, a dirty one. Right. But the diaper zone, I don't want that trach there ever, especially not one I'm getting ready to put in. We don't want E. coli in the airway, sure. you know, for instance. And those things, it's, it doesn't take much to put the trach, keep it clean rather than th- just nonchalantly, purposely just, throat in a diaper zone, for instance, right. you know, so that's one of the things I, you know, I, it's, some of the things, you, it's just not a big deal. You know, you just don't do it like this. If you don't do every other step, but, but certain things I'm pretty peculiar about because I don't want, I don't want kids to have infections that could be prevented, you oh, know, but oh, absolutely. everyday well, thing, and, like and, I said, kids put their hands all over the place, things you can't avoid, but if you put in a brand new trike, it's sterile in a package, don't take it out and it's throw it next to the yeah, I know. diaper I area understand. before you put it in. You know, I'm like, what? Well, in yeah, the case so. of John, he did, you know, he did. He's been fortunate. And I, I, I'm i sure because of, we've been isolated last. And actually, I'll, that's what I'll ask you in a minute, and then I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude. Mm. But is uh, he uh, he would, he would did come down with a few, you know, infections. He had, he had pneumonia. And, and uh, some of it could be accredited to, you know, hopefully, proper trait care was actually was was considered in that but you know he was prone to catching uh, especially when he was, in, he was in grade school his first year in mm-hmm. kindergarten he would come down with with ailments and it was usually long related i mean he was he was fine but he would run a fever and get catch pneumonia or something related and it would have well, some you resp- bypass the upper airway yeah. basically so some child, child uh coughs and sneezes and whatever and he just inhales us through his trach. Yeah. And oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, if you breathe through your nose, you, you can feel the discomfort and you can realize oh, this isn't good. But like in his case, like we went camping one year and and uh, he was breathing near the campfire and didn't think much of it. And then he was like, I don't mm. feel good. Well, because he didn't have that response to, to uh, you know, this is this is unpleasant. You know, he, he didn't mm-hmm. have it as, as, as prevalent because he wasn't going through breathing through his, his yeah. nose. Uh, or not enough, but so one question though I do I want to ask is so how has COVID affected your world, just generally? Well, yeah. In the so the main thing, one thing I've we've noticed is that we've had a lot less sick children because everybody's been so careful. So we haven't had we had all, even in the adult world we had like I had one patient with the flu and that was right in. March when COVID just started. Otherwise, I had like no patient with the flu this year. The kids were much healthier. I mean, we had much less sick kids in the hospital, uh, probably due to the COVID because they didn't go to school. They didn't catch stuff from other kids. Mm-hmm. So that they have done much better. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed, we had kids that we saw in check and clinic. We've done virtual visits, which is fine with me too. But we have had kids that needed certain procedures to maybe progress them to the next steps towards getting the trach decannulated. Um, where we wanted to do a sleep study or we wanted to do a, you know, the ENT doctors wanted to take them to the OR to look at the airway. And for these procedures, they require a COVID test. And families did not want to object their child to a COVID test because it, it does hurt some. They said, mm-hmm. no, my child's been so enough. We're just going to wait. And so they, they've been holding off. Some of them have been holding off with procedures. Some many of them have not, you know, but some have where they specifically because they said, No, I don't want the COVID test. Mm-hmm. So it just depends. Some families were, were holding off and others said, No, but if it needs to be done, we'll do it. We'll do the COVID test as well. Um, I've noticed I've had families that uh, canceled all their nurses because they were afraid that the nurses would bring in COVID. I've had families or children that caught COVID. I had a whole family cut, catch COVID from a nurse because they were very hunkered down. They did nothing during COVID, tried to keep everybody healthy. And then one of the nurses brought COVID in and they all got sick. Mm. Um, but a lot of times my patients were really not the sickest. They actually managed pretty good because yeah. they... Well, this last year was, was John's healthiest year. It was in 2020. Yeah. And Both even kids. with COVID, kids caught, when kids caught COVID, even I've had some... I've had a, a, an ex nicu preemie catch COVID and the family did not notice. They said, yeah, the child was a little sick, but, and then he had just a routine test, mm-hmm. uh, well, not routine test, a routine procedure where they needed a COVID test before and he became, he was positive and they couldn't believe it. Nobody else really had symptoms and he was, um, 
he had some symptoms, but not anything bad. He was never hospitalized with mm-hmm. it, even though he had COVID. And he you would think he's high risk. He's an ex NICU baby, you know. Right. So so I've had another child that caught COVID. He was a little bit older, uh, where a nurse brought it in and it was like around Christmas time. He spent Christmas and COVID isolation in the hospital. Goodness. And his mother was so sick from COVID that she couldn't take care of him and the nursing agency pulled all the nurses. Oh, so goodness. the nurses gave them COVID. And then, and then they took pulled all the support away help. too. Yeah. And then the and then the mom was really sick, where she was miserable, and she couldn't take care of him. So he was hospitalized simply because she then and and he was not that sick. He, mm. I mean, I visited him. We were just playing around in his room. He was laughing and doing. They celebrated Christmas right before all this. They knew already. Oh my God, we kept in COVID. We don't have bad symptoms. Let's celebrate real quick Christmas mm-hmm. and then. So in that case, you know, I mean, they're just wonderful. And but but he was, uh, they were very afraid that uh, COVID would be very detrimental to this child. But he just coasted right through just fine. So I've I've not um, had too many problems with children being very sick. I've even had older kids that are now in the adult world, uh, a few that caught COVID and were inpatient with it, but none of them had it really bad. Which That's, is a blessing. It is a blessing. And I, and I know, I was going to tell you, you were talking about the COVID test. Unfortunately, poor John has had several this past year. So if, mm. if there's any, and of course, it's hopefully winding down. But if uh, if they need anybody to talk to, he can <laughs> he can tell you. Mm-hmm. It's, tell you how it's like, right? Yeah. He, right, right before he was decannulated, he had another one. And he was just like, okay. He just didn't care. He was like, <laughs> he had it done so many Do times. It. <laughs> Wow. Um, and I didn't like it. This shows but... how resilient they are. Yeah, I had, a, I had a flu test once where they did the same thing, and it felt like they stuck a toilet brush up I, my nose and scrub. it. I think like, for hey, me, the flu, COVID, t- I had that before, and I thought that hurt more dead. than COVID. So. Yeah, COVID, I had one in March when I had, like last last year, when I had exposure, and it wasn't that bad. I'm like, are you, and it was negative. I'm like, how can I be negative after this crazy? That was before, right. I mean, before we even wore the N95 mask, was mm-hmm. at the beginning of all of this. I'm like, oh my God, we have the second COVID patient in the hospital, and I'm already exposed. I was going to, you know, but that but was the only down. one, and I've never been yeah. sick. And then well, the moment that shot came out, I went for it. You know, yeah, well, we've been fortunate. Nice to- yeah, we were all fortunate. And I, we uh, we had a. I'm, I'm team Pfizer. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know if they're going to, I don't know how the, how low they're going to go in the ages. You may know that answer. I don't know. Um, I know they're I'm just... hoping, well, I'm hoping that, um, I, I mean, especially now where all the masks are not required anymore. And here you go with your unimmunized child mm-hmm. and even though the kids aren't getting that sick, you still, I mean, COVID, that's like a horrible virus. You still don't want them to have exposure to it, right. you know? It's kind of a little scary that part of it. I wish we could just vaccinate everybody. Right. You know, did you? Hopefully, that they, they'll do soon. So, did you? Have you encountered any parents? I, I, I'm kind of curious on this. So, you know, mm-hmm. there's this is Central Texas for us, and and I know some of the mentality had had been deny denial and anti mask. But would mm-hmm. you say of your co, of your trach patients and trach families? Did have they taken it consistently? Have you seen them take it seriously? Um, yeah, very. And I've had uh, several where, and, and also when I see them, you know, especially the little older ones that I see, the, the ones that cross over to the adult world, uh, I ask all of them, how about COVID tests? Because they can get, you know, they're 17 and older, they can get immunized against mm-hmm. it. And so I'm asking and um, yeah, I've had several, and said, oh, we got everybody immunized. We got everybody. <laughs> all, right. all the nurses, the entire family, we all did it, you know, just to get this at the moment they had the opportunity they did it so i've had a lot of families that that got uh, vaccinated i have some of my adult trach patients where they're still on the fence and like well as long as it and you know as long as it's not experimental i had one family say well we got the shot and then the uh, wife was saying um you know even if the government is tracking us it's not going to bother me they're tracking us with cell phones (laughs) anyway that's my point i work in marketing about it yeah, I'm in digital marketing, and I can tell you we can track a lot more with this phone than we could with a. <laughs> yeah, with it, and I said, trust me, you know, I volunteered a day and gave those COVID shots. It's a very, very little bit of substance and a skinny little needle. There's nothing we can stick in there to track you. Trust me, if we could, it would be amazing. We wouldn't have such clunky cell phones, you know. 
<laughs> sure, I, agree. I was like, yeah. So I, but but they still did it, even though they felt, you know, that. And and I've had, uh, interestingly, when I, I don't, I and mean, I volunteered that one day just to do it, uh, and they were, they finally gave me some stickers to give out. I'm like, oh, cool! I got stickers to give the people that get the COVID shot. I, didn't like, get I got mine. vaccinated. I didn't, get a I didn't either. I didn't get a sticker, and here they gave me a little bad. So immediately, I was like trying to dish them out to the people, and like second lady there, I gave the shot to. She said, "Yeah, oh, you want a sticker?" And she looked at me, and turned out she didn't want nobody knowing she got oh, shot gotcha so she did it anyway but that was i thought that was very interesting she did it anyway but she didn't want but her whole community her inner circle didn't believe it and she didn't want nobody to know her friends and family that she actually went to get it that is that's interesting, interesting that's a fur that's you a know, so so there might be some that secretly get it even though they're all kind of objecting this stuff, but they get it anyway. So I, I never knew that was even happening, but I bet there are some. They might even say, no, I didn't get the shot, and they probably actually And they did. did. That is an so, interesting so perspective. You have, to, you have to look at that. That, I, that was a very unique, weird, I mean, different perspective. I'm like, huh, interesting. Yeah. Surely that's Regardless, not isolated. You know? It's got to be others no. that did that. Yeah. Huh. But I told everybody the moment, you know, I got the shot December 15th at Tuesday, like four o'clock. And <laughs> as soon as I got the shot, you know, I was a little scared. <laughs> but sure. as soon as I got it, I told everybody, all my colleagues, all my patients, you know what? I got the shot. As soon as you have the opportunity, go get it. It's important, you know, and just trying to, uh, to get people to be less scared, you know? And, yeah. and so I, but, but I, I think for my pediatric population, they can't get the shot yet, but I think that, um, I think they were all very reasonable. Maybe the reason is because if you're taking care of a child that has a trach, you're kind of in- medically inclined and you have yeah. a little bit different understanding than the general population. So if you know that, I mean, you're used to infectious diseases and if there's something that can prevent an infectious disease, if there's something that pre- prevents your child from being hospitalized and being sick, you would do that. And I think that's maybe why so many of my families are are not necessarily affecting it because they, that's what I'm thinking because they, well, and they, that's true. They understand different on a different level. You know, I, I think, I don't know. When I was, and I, I, you know, a report I had read years ago before COVID and it was a video of news report was that in, in like Japan, it's common that if you have a cold, if you're sick, you wear a mask. And so oh, yeah, China too. Um, in China too. Yeah. And so, I just, I just was always, so I always had this mindset that if I was very sick, I would likely wear a mask. I didn't, I hadn't been that, mm-hmm. haven't been that sick, but I, so for me, I was like, this seems, this seems like a, and I didn't mean to turn this into a COVID discussion, but it's, uh, it's just interesting because with John though, yeah, you're, you're right. We, we knew that he was susceptible to issues. Now at the same time, we were also comforted a little bit because we had our doctor tell us that. While we were hopeful he won't get it, if he does get it and did have to have, be hospitalized, he's already got the trach. It's easier to, if they did have to do any anything extreme, he's ready to go. You know, he's got the he's got the hook. He's ready to exactly. roll. Exactly. And yeah, so he, the problem with COVID is it scars up the airways because a lot of patients are intubated so long. I don't know. It just messes up the airways. And if somebody already has a trach, yes, they don't need to be intubated. They have a tr- trach already. And they can be on a ventilator and they don't have risk for running, for getting right. a scarred airway after they recover. Absolutely. That's, that's a total factor. Yes. So, so for we, while we were hopeful he wouldn't, and we took precautions, we were also a little comforted to say, well, you know, we're more likely to be hurt more than he would be. So we, we were a little, little comforted by that. Well, you know, I appreciate you talking to me tonight. I, I didn't, <laughs> yeah, I can tell the conversation's over when we go into COVID and conspiracy theories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and you know what? Uh, since we, uh, you know, we can just continue forever. <laughs> yeah. <It's> like, <laughs> But, uh, but no, it was fun. Yeah. I appreciate this. I'm glad you came on and I may, you know, I may keep your name down for, for future topics. Um, I've got a few other people, uh, I tell you what's challenging and, and I'll say this is it's hard to get some parents want to talk. Some parents, some people just, mm-hmm. they want to talk and tell their story. And then some, like I've had issues on some of the groups though, like the trait groups, cause they don't, they don't want, they think you're advertising. And so it's hard to get 
guests. Advertising like what? The podcast. They think that, oh, you're in it to make money. And like I said, uh, for those oh. who've listened, I don't, you know, I've, I've got, I told you earlier, I've got 11, I've made $11 over a year and a half, you know, and that's still sitting yeah. in the account that, that was set up with Anchor. The well, I, I have another problem with, for instance, parents are making money through, um, um, through what's it called? Uh, like influencers and stuff, you know, yeah. and trying to, trying to make, and some of them use their children, I not use, but, um, utilize, uh, you know, to get donations and things, you know, and that's a little bit. Yeah. And I, I'll, with. I don't, I'm, well, I mean, I can, I guess I'll see parents. That, uh, it's very rare. That, that, but it's well, I, but strange. I see parents though that do that and will use this as a means to, to garner support. Now I, you know, I've started the podcast and to raise awareness and I, you know, I, I'll do those types of things and, and I just feel weird for somebody, especially now that he's decannulated, I just feel weird. Somebody giving you a, a, a pity donation. You know, I, I say that. Yeah. I know some parents absolutely 100% need it. Um, you know, but we were fortunate. But they're usually not the ones to, to, you know, they're usually pretty quiet. Yeah. And, and I've it, looked at writing a book, you know, for this simply just to tell, document the story for him and, and, and to show, cause I definitely went through a big emotional change or at least a, a, a fundamental change with myself when he was, when he was born, you know, um, to where I, I started feeling more humbled by situations and I felt, um, I it changed me for the good, you know, and, and, yeah, and I, uh, and one I don't, of my moms wrote a book about that. And uh, one of my moms and I, uh, she wrote a book and got it published about her NICU experience. Yeah. And I don't have any issue and, with and it that. Was, it was very, it was very interesting for me as a um, nurse to read her inside yeah. story because I worked much more with dad in NICU she was a lot more reserved, but interestingly, she observed everything. When I read some pages and she described some things, I'm like, I, it was like a movie in front of my eyes. I'm like, yeah. I remember, and I remember her, but I could never look into her head. Right. Now I know what was going through her mind. She just wasn't as open as I am. I'm like a talker. I just tell you what I think. Sure. But some people are much more reserved, and that's probably where I have more problems with because I'm so open. I'm like, if you have a problem or you have a question, tell me, you know, but not every parent can. Right. Well, I'm almost like that. You know, it's just like when you were training Jacqueline, um, I was watching and I asked a few questions, but for me, it was like, okay, if I, I guess if I have a question, I can either call her or Jacqueline, maybe Jacqueline mm-hmm. saw it because I'm just, I'm just that personality, but, it, but I'll say the experience changed me and some parents, it changes them too. And I'm okay with them sharing those experiences. There's no, I don't mm-hmm. think, but I, I just take issue when that, whenever they um, intentionally just find other angles to, to garner sad, fe- you know, feelings of, Oh, the poor family yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. intentionally, yeah, yeah, exactly. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of odd. I mean, some moms, for instance, sell trach ties and little day, they sew little, little, but yeah, I don't have issues. I really yeah, don't have issues that's with really that. That's really cool. You know, I understand yeah, that. We, that's we awesome bought some, you know, they're really neat. Um, and then I've contacted a mom and said, I love your product. She said, no, I cannot sell to your children's hospital because I wanted to. I said, you know, she said, I'm a mom, mom with two little kids. I, I can sell, make some, but not this amount. I'm like, oh, dang it. You know, I really yeah. like those. Yeah. But, well, one thing, uh, yeah, that's, an, that's an, that could be a whole other episode of trick ties. You know, we, we, I think I'm not, now no one sponsors this, but like Neotech has some very nice, very nice ones that we liked yeah. and, and, uh, we're they, you get, colorful too. Yeah. So colorful. You get camo, you could get different, different designs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to let you go. I appreciate you coming on today. I can't thank Svenja enough for coming on the podcast and we hope to have her on again in the near future. She is a wealth of information and provides a great perspective from that of a healthcare professional. If you are now or have been the parent of a trach child, or perhaps you have or had a trach yourself and would like to be a guest on our show to help others, visit trachbaby.com and fill out the form. We hope today's episode has helped in some way. Thank you for listening.